get mean right there. <laughs> I don't want to be mean. I like you guys. <laughs> uh, well, I uh, just look at it. It's kind of funny because uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, and do no evil. It's kind of, uh, you guys remember the little monkeys when you were kids, you know, right? You know, the, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil uh, monkeys. Uh, and uh, they, they sold them and so on and so forth. But the title, in order to fit in with the message today, uh, I want you to understand something. There's a big word that I'll use for you today. It's called introspection. Uh <clears throat> and introspection is nothing more uh, than taking examination of one's uh, conscious thoughts and feelings. What you're thinking and what you're feeling today. Uh, taking a look at those things. And I'm going to tell you, as a kid, I was probably uh, being raised in an alcoholic's home, seeing the violence. Uh, seeing my mom beat black and blue from her ankle to the back of her neck with belt buckles. Uh, seeing my brothers and sisters uh, and myself go through the, the physical and mental and emotional abuse uh, that we so often witnessed. I was probably a little strange as a child in that I probably spent more time being introspective and thinking about things than most people did. Spent a lot of time tucked away in a bedroom, uh, hiding from the violence that was taking place outside a bedroom doorway. Spent a lot of time in there thinking. Sometimes thoughts just like all of you have. Sometimes crazy thoughts. So I think about my dad abusing my mom. I'd sit in that bedroom sometimes and as I would consciously think about the things that were going on, I'd think I could kill him. Never bad an eye. If I had a gun in my hand right now, I could walk out of this room and put a bullet in his face and sleep soundly tonight. It's pretty deep, isn't it? Yet yeah, that's the introspective thoughts. When we begin to look at our consciousness, we begin to look at our way of thinking sometimes. And yet somewhere there was this still simple voice, thank God, that always was saying, don't do it. Don't do it. You know where the gun's at. You know where the bullets are. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's kind of like when you start to take a look at yourself introspectively, it's almost like that cartoon where the devil sits on one shoulder and the angel sits on the other. And there's this eternal argument that is taking place, these voices yes. that are spitting off things in your head. I spent a lot of time doing that as a kid. I think really that it was kind of to my advantage because it helped me early on in life recognize and realize that I was a nutbag. Yeah, I'm crazy and no, I'm crazy. I've said it for so long. That is the advantage I have over probably 99% of you in this room. Is that you're crazy and don't know you're crazy. I'm crazy and no, I'm crazy. I know what I'm capable of because I've thought about it long and hard at times. I've avoided it and fought against it. Some of you, you know those demons I'm talking about. We write them off at times to post-traumatic stress disorder and all other kinds of psychological evaluations that we've been given. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's just demons of hell that are rising up trying to still kill and destroy and take our very livelihood from us. I wonder about kids today, you know, in... 1967, that'd be 55 years ago now, wow. Is that right? Yeah, 55 years ago. Charles Hummel wrote the classic book, Tyranny of the Urgent, where he describes the telephone. Listen to this. In 1967, 55 years ago, 
Tyranny of the urgent. Charles Hummel describes the telephone as one of the worst offenders to our peace and complacency. Tyranny. Cruel and oppressive government rule. In this case, those things which we consider urgent to get done or controlling and oppressing our life are still in our life away. And so humble, he identified our problem as not an issue with time, but as much as an issue with our priorities. Yes, amen. You see, there's the same 24 hours in every day. There's the same 365 days a year that we have always been given. What are we doing with our time? And if in 1965, if Mr. Hummel thought that the telephone was going to be one of the most tyrannical instruments to our sanity that would ever be placed in our hands, what would he think today, man? We have many television screens that we hold in the palm of our hand. We carry them everywhere. You don't ever hear anybody say, I don't have service here anymore. We've got service everywhere. Anywhere we go, any place we're at, we are occupied. Our minds, we don't self-reflect anymore. We don't sit back and think about things because our mind is always clouded by something we hold in the palm of our hand. Most of you didn't have a surprise or shocked look on your face when I mentioned Brother Jason and the post that had been shot out on Facebook, their private life, thrown out for everybody and their brother to see. Poor decision making in my opinion. But Jason, as I looked out over the congregation, you know how I am, I check people out. I watched their eyes, I looked for the actions, I didn't see anybody go, oh. you know why? Everyone have already seen it. There was no secret here today. They were all just wondering how we were going to handle it. How you were going to handle it. Most of them, maybe even some of them were here today because they wanted to see the spectacle, whether you were going to make it. Or whether you'd laid out drunk all night. That's what we occupy our times with now. We don't occupy our time with the Word of God. We occupy our time with anything and everybody else's business but our own. We occupy our time with televisions, series, and my goodness, my wife, she drives me crazy. Between Brandy and Patty and Cresha and the stupid shows and series that they pump into her ear, I have watched some of the dumbest television ever created in the history of mankind in just the last six months, and you don't get to watch it. One episode a week, you get to watch it all at one time. We binge watch, man. They're about to kill me. I didn't realize that actors could act that poorly. That shows could be that absolutely. I mean, they make days of our lives look like a, a, an Oscar winning performance week in and week out. They're that silly. And my wife, every night now, every night, if there's something I want to watch, oh no, up, hush. We didn't watch NASCAR last night. Fortunately, they rained out. You don't know why? Because the first thing out of her mouth is she, she sneaks over, got a little pillow lays in the middle of bed, the controller lays there, right? And she kind of lovingly, she brushed up against me, you know. But she ain't brushed up against me because she wants to rub my belly uh, or stroke my cheek and tell me how much she loves me. She's sneaking her arm over to that pillow <laughs> to grab that controller. And then after she has it in the grasp of her dirty little paw, this is her question to me. Are you watching that? <laughs> With psycho eyes. Are you watching that? No, I'm not watching that. <laughs> you want to watch our show? Sure, let's watch our show. And for until until she finally inevitably starts snoring in the midst of one of the episodes, I never regain control of the controller and of the television. 
Now we laugh about that because most of you have experienced that in your life. But the truth of the matter is, is we occupy our time with so many things, man. I mean, we're absolutely occupied. And God really, in His Word today, He's just trying to get us to understand that, man, we need to really take the time. Hey, it's okay to watch TV. I'm, I'm not that one-eyed devil preacher, man. I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, it's okay to have cell phones. It's okay to have all those things. But we still, even in the midst of having technology and having those things that are available to us, we need to be able to take the time to set them down and to take an introspective look at ourselves from time to time to really get a grasp on who we are, where we're at, what we're doing, and where we're going in life. If we don't do that, we're missing it, man. And when we miss it, you'll fade off into a series of shows. And before you know it, you'll identify yourself as the characters in those. I'm like that. That's me. No, you ain't. No, you ain't. Shut that stupid thing off. You ain't no biker chick. We ain't even got a bike. You got a bicycle out in the garage. Your kids flattened the tires on it six months ago. We ain't even got a tube back in it yet. You ain't no biker chick. You ain't no son of anarchy. <laughs> Bikers and soap operas. Nah, man, it's just crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> oh. She, uh, you guys like this. She said we have to start watching the series. <laughs> I said, okay. I expected it to be pretty current. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize that they were 14 seasons in. <laughs> and there are 13 to 14 episodes per season. And so I quickly began to do the math in my head. And I said, whoa, heaven, we got to watch like 133 episodes of this. So let me take you into the Word of God today, man. In the book of James, uh, I think that we need to really identify what's important in life. We need to avoid temptation uh, to hurry through life, never examining our life. I think it's important for us that uh, we uh, take the time to examine our life. It's so in the book of James, in verse 19 of the first chapter, man, James is beginning to speak to us. Remember, James is an expert, okay, on never examining his own life. For real. I mean, this dude grew up with God sleeping in the same bedroom. And didn't have a clue. I don't know where James' mind was at, but his brother was Jesus. And he grew up in the same house together. And yet James makes it clear that there is always temptation lurking about. Uh, that he's always looking for a place to creep into our life. And now his brother Jesus is going on to heaven and the only way James can talk with him to him is through prayer. Just like you and I. And yet he had the king of kings and the lord of lords sleeping in the same bedroom. Brothers. So you say, well, I'm, I'm pretty good about paying attention and taking uh, an introspective look at my life, are you? Are you that much better than James that you sleep in the same bed with Jesus or the same bedroom with Jesus and yet you miss the fact that your brother's the savior of the world until after he's crucified, placed in a tomb, rose from the grave and now you want to talk to him? Now you want to talk to him? What occupies your time? What occupies your mind that you don't want to talk to Jesus right now? Take a look at what you have in your life and what's going on and what it is that's interfering. So the word of God says in verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. It's so simple what James is beginning to preach. He's just simply preaching on the human anatomy in verse 19, what God gave us. We've heard it for years, haven't we? We have two ears and one mouth. Why? Because God wants us to listen twice as much and talk half as much. God gave us two ears because he wants us to receive and hear and listen 
to what it is that's going on around us. He gave us one mouth so that we could keep it closed most of the time. And yet we have it so messed up and so backwards that we refuse to listen and hear things as they are. We want to run our mouths about anything and everything that is going on like we're knowledgeable about it. Like we're experts in the idea of it. Sometimes we need to take a look at ourselves and allow ourselves to be educated enough to say, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. Uh, but I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to hear what it is that you have to say. or I'm willing to listen to both sides of a story. Uh, I'm willing to listen to facts. And I'm willing to listen to things that are brought to me. Uh, but I really don't feel comfortable speaking on them uh, until I get all the facts. You see, most churches today have become gossip centers of their community. It's where people gather together to cut each other apart with their tongues, their little cliques and their little groups. You know what I'm talking about. We don't, I hope we don't do it here at Momentum. I think that we're all just one big hodgepodge of mutts. It's kind of the way I look at us. Sorry. Huh? But that's the way I look at us here at Momentum Community Church. We're just a bunch of mutts, man. We're made up of all kinds of garbage. They ain't none of us purebred. They ain't none of us perfect. And yet we have churches today where there are people residing in the pews just like you are here who feel like they are. They feel like their stuff don't stink. Ooh, never heard a preacher say that. Uh, oh, Dale, help me. I've lost my mind. Switch me to another verse. Wherefore, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. We're quick to run into every fight, every argument that comes along anymore, man. We're quick to get into, I mean, man, if you don't think that's the truth, man, then uh, you have, you're, you're one of the good ones that hasn't been on social media here in the past years. We've talked about presidencies. We've talked about Trump. We've talked about Biden. We've talked about Pelosi. We've talked about uh, every person that's in political office at some phase, at some point. No, we've talked about COVID. We've talked about masks. We've talked about all kinds of stuff. And a lot of it's made us mad. Made us mad. I'm glad that when my mother came to life at Muncie Central Hospital, that the old man in me began to rise up and the anger began to settle within me and my blood began to boil. And I began to think to myself, I could walk through the doors of that hospital if I could find the doctor that allowed my mother to be pumped full of fentanyl and to die a death all by herself based on a stupid thing called COVID that we don't even hear nothing about now. Right. I go in there and tear his face off. And then God's still small spirit say your mama wouldn't want that. That's true. Your mama wouldn't want that. The spirit of God certainly doesn't want that. Mom. Go home, Reno. <laughs> go home and prepare to lift up your family who is heartbroken. Go home. And get prepared to pre preach the woman's funeral who you got to spend 81 of her beautiful years with here on this earth. Go home and get prepared to move on with your life. Don't jump back into that bitterness and that anger and that resentfulness. Yeah. Don't run back to the ball. Don't destroy everything that you worked for. Don't throw the church away. Don't throw everything away in a fit of rage, in a moment of anger. Yeah, we see it all the time, don't we? All the time. And so verse 20 says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. That's James just preaching. I don't have to. He's saying what I'm saying. He just does it more poetic and quite more simply than I can do it. Verse 21 goes on and says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Folks, it's not me. It's not Jason. 
It's not someone that you put confidence in. It's not Stephen Furtick. It's not Joe Olstein. It's not the people that you watch on Sunday morning that are going to save your soul. It's the engrafted Word of God that still works. It's the Word of God. Because Jesus is the Word of God made life. And the only way the Bible teaches, the Word teaches, is through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way to the Father except by Him. <sighs> Which is able to save your souls. Verse 22 says, but be ye doers of the Word. Yes. Amen. And not hearers only. Amen. Deceiving your own selves. We live in a society today in a world where we have people who are far more educated than I am, who are great hearers of the Word of God. So much so that they become great instructors, great teachers, people who claim to have gifts and prophetic things that God has placed on them and they'll speak and speak and speak and speak and speak and speak and speak until their words become of no avail. Because not indifferent, folks, if you're so holy, not indifferent from me being up here behind this pulpit, you better figure out that the mind can't absorb more than the rear end can handle. Yeah. And when all you do is want to hear yourself talk, learn to shut up. Shut your mouth because nobody else wants to hear it anymore. Yeah. Ooh, preach, Reno. That's good. <laughs> if you remove something old, you've got to replace it with something new or the old will return. Mom, that's truth right there. That's biblical. Mom. So when you remove something old, you better be re willing to replace it with something new or the old will return. We find out in the book of Luke, skip over real quick, Dylan, and then we'll jump back to those last few verses in the book of James. But in the book of Luke, in the 20th verse, it says, but if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 21 says, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. Verse 23 says, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Saying, man, if you ain't with Jesus, if you ain't doing the work of Jesus, if you're not walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus, you're doing something that is Spitefully working against him. You say, oh, not me. Oh, not me. Verse 24 says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and find none. He saith, I will return unto my house which I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Again, folks, if you get rid of something old, you better replace it with something new. If not, the old will return. Verse 26 says, Then goeth he and taketh him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. <clears throat> That's just good old fire and brimstone preaching today, folks. Let me tell you from my perspective. Come on, man. I've been close. I've been close to inviting demons seven times worse back into a house that was swept of God. Glory be to God that His grace was sufficient for me and that He was great enough that He upheld me in the midst of my turmoil when I was falling on my face. When I wanted to go back and be a drunkard, He said, it's going to be worse. Yes, yes. I said, how? How could it possibly be worse? How could I ever be worse than I've ever been? He said, look around you. He said, when you were your worst, you barely had anything to lose. Just you, yourself, and 
I now look around you. Your children, your wife, your family, your church, the people who are counting on you. Do you really want them to see your life seven times worse than it's ever been? In reality, brother, I don't think I could ever look through it. I barely made it through it with the singularity that was just me making stupid decisions. How in the world would I live, Kelly, seven times worse in my life? And so we go back, Dell, into the book of James. I'm getting ready to close. The babies are crying, and Reno's going home. <laughs> That's my cue. Thank you, sweet child. <laughs> the church today has many more hearers than doers. They come, they hear, they leave next Sunday. They come, they hear, they leave next Sunday. They come, they hear, they leave next Sunday. But James' response was you're deceiving yourselves. What manner of man or woman are you? Do you look into the mirror of God's word and behold who you really are? Do you confess to God and to yourself and to others who you really are? After you see yourself as you really are, do you get down on your knees and weep? Begging God for mercy and to change what you see now. If you never look in the mirror... You never take the time to read God's word and examine who you really are. You deceive yourselves. So you come, you hear, you leave next Sunday. You come, you hear, you leave next Sunday. You come, you hear, you leave, and nothing ever changes. And James closes with this in verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not forgetful, not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And if any man among you seem to be religious and bridle of not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is pure vain. Verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Stand with me. You want to show people Christ in your life? Do what the Word of God says. Don't just come to church and make your appearance here because you think it makes you look holy because it doesn't. If anything, it should make us look like we're desperate. In need. Desperate. Reaching, searching, going after a holy God. Wanting His Word. Desiring to be fed. Don't kill the messenger. Take a look at what it is that God's trying to teach you and say to you. You see, most people get caught up in religion. And religion's a killer. Salvation is when we ask Jesus into our heart and into our life and He begins to make a change. We begin to take a look at our life. We begin to see the mistakes we have made and we are making. And we make a decision to allow Christ Jesus to change us. That we can do the will of God. That we can go visit the fatherless, the widows in their affliction. Keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Feed the poor. Pray with those who need prayer. Counsel with those that need counsel. Love on those that need love. In other words, don't show up for church on Sunday. You can't hardly breathe. Having bathed yourself in the world all week and not God's word thinking your religion is getting you to heaven it's deception you remember what the cook said the proof's in the pudding <laughs> that's stupid <laughs> what's proof doesn't even make sense to me the proof's in the pudding I guess if the pudding's good and 
It's proof that the hands that have prepared it knew what they were doing. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, I love you today. Thank you, God, that we can smile and laugh and enjoy ourselves in the house of God. And yet at the same time, God, you can bear down upon us with truth. Lord, I pray that if there's any under the sound of my voice that needs to know you as Lord and Savior, let today be the day that they cry out with a prayer. A prayer that would say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm sorry that your son Jesus had to die for the wrongs that I've committed. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Save me right now. And help me to grow in your word and in your love and in your attitude of praise. And thanksgiving. And thank you for your son Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. Father, as we go our separate ways, dismiss us into your love and your kindness. Keep your hand upon us. Protect us. Guide us. Direct us. Lead us in the ways of righteousness for your name's sake. That we might come back and rejoice and give praise and glory and honor to the King of kings and the Lord of Lord always. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you for a great Sunday service. Y'all got to learn to clap at the end of this. No, more. Better. Better clap. Praise the Lord. I watch it on camera, and it sounds like three people are here. <laughs>